I think we can begin now. So Dimitri is going to tell you something about the security of the IC backside. Please give him a warm round of applause. All right. So unfortunately, uh, my, my co-authors that I've done a lot of this research with uh, couldn't be here. But so I, I get to do this alone. But this wasn't by any means just my work. But uh, and so this is a nice for people who maybe saw David Oswald's talk today. He kind of did a, a nice introduction to a lot of the concepts uh, I'll, I'll cover today in terms of security. And also uh, anyone who saw the talk by the Infineon guys just now, I'm sure got a very good overview as well. But that was in German, so I'll be covering a lot of the same stuff, but in English. So here's just a little bit about me. So I'm a third year PhD student at TU Berlin at Security and Telecommunications. Uh, so one of the, my main interests is physical attacks. So what's a physical attack against an IC? That's where you actually go in and you do something to the transistors. So not externally connecting an oscilloscope, it's where you completely open up the device, you go in, you put a, a needle down or something along those lines. So, and, and also we'll learn what, what exactly these, all these terms are. So semi and fully invasive uh, analysis is, is kind of what, what we did, which was never done before. And uh, a, an important thing which, which I mentioned at all of my talks is, is failure analysis, because a lot of people think that you know, we're applying this to security, and no one has ever thought of this before. And where, you know, how do people come up with these crazy ideas to do all these things? And it turns out there's a, there's a whole industry for this, and the industry is failure analysis. So what failure analysis is, is, uh, is basically you have your, when you're producing a chip and something goes wrong, you don't know what went wrong. So now you have to sit there and you have to, uh, you basically have to reverse engineer your own device, even though you designed it, because you don't know what went wrong. So that's failure analysis. And so there's my you know, Twitter, and if you want to co contact me by email, and I'm especially proud, it's my homage to, to Dan that I got such a cool domain name. So this is just kind of a, a, a joke. So people who do electrical engineering and maybe don't know this will, will uh, appreciate this. So this is kind of uh, this was an April Fool's joke done by Signetics many years ago, and uh, this is this shows you from a conceptual level uh, some of the main misconceptions that people have when it comes to hardware. And if you apply to security, the, the one of the main uh, misconceptions when it comes to security. And so this, as the joke is, so this is a, a data sheet. And what this is is a fully encoded random access write-only memory. So I don't know if people see the contradiction between uh, memory and write-only, but it doesn't make a, a lot of sense. And actually, nowadays, you, you do have write-only memory or certain types of write-only memories or things that are called write-only memory. But this was back in the 70s, and this literally meant something that you write to, and you can never get the data out. And so the never get the data out is, uh, is kind of expressed in some of the applications, my favorite of which is the first in never out buffer. So. <laughs> So your data goes in, and it never gets out. And this is the, I mean, everyone here is, is laughing, and they see how absurd this is. But when you, when you talk to vendors, when you talk to people doing security, or people who try to build secure systems, they assume they write the data onto the secure hardware, and that's it. There's no way to get it out, because the hardware has encryption. It's encrypting everything. Everything's being executed you know, on the device, and everything's being processed on the device. It never leaves the device in an unencrypted form. And that's all true but that means that it still gets decrypted on the device. So on the device somewhere, there's an area where you can find this and, and uh, basically you know, break the crypto by getting it decrypted, and the device does all the decryption for you. You don't even have to know how it works. And so we'll, we'll cover that a couple of times as well. So here's kind of the outline for today. So I'm going to do some background. Uh, and so there's, uh, then I'm going to get into uh, IC reverse engineering. And then we'll talk about what the backside is of, of an IC and why this is important. And finally, we'll get into the more exciting stuff that we did, which was the kind of new research, the semi and fully invasive uh, stuff. So for that, I have a nice little uh, part of a, which is a nice, also a nice motivation, a nice part of a nice BBC documentary, which was done. And so I hope the, let's hope the sound works. Okay. 
and ITVs on digital had picked one of those competitor systems. It was made by a French company called Canal Plus. Their smart card had never been hacked. Canal Plus Technologies was so confident in their ability to supply a secure system that they stated very openly that it was unhackable. The people who were selling us the microprocessor in which we embedded our software were telling us and talking about the largest companies in this world of microprocessors cannot be broken. Your software cannot be extracted. But it could, and NDS had the resources to do it. Oliver Cummerling did crack open the Canal Plus card. NDS now possessed their competitor's greatest commercial secret. Did people from the team in Haifa, your team, reverse engineer, get a readout, understand the secrets of the Canal Plus encryption system? Of the Canal Plus card, yes. OK, so, so you get the idea. And so what happens is uh, you extract the software from a, from a smart card, and then you can build something like this, which, uh, I mean, I'll mention it also later. We're going to be hanging around, so if anyone wants to see all this kind of stuff, because, I mean, it's impressive to me how simple it is, uh, you, can, you can come and talk to me. But so what this is, is it's one of the original pirate cards. So once they extracted the software, they knew how the cryptographic algorithm worked, and now they could go and grab a different microcontroller and make a PCB that uh, basically you know, fits into a, to a pay TV uh, receiver, and you stick the card in, and now you didn't pay anything, but you have all the channels. So th this, is what, this is what results from it. So again, th the, the thing is, uh, this is, this is what used to be the case for the industry, because now it kind of shifted. Because it used to be that the, the, the obfuscation was the fact, was kind of what we talked about before. It was just the data. The fact there was data on the chip was considered to be uh, a big enough kind of protection mechanism to protect anyone from uh, attacks, because no one would ever be able to extract the software from from, from a chip, and now we know that's not true. So what uh, we'll, we'll be kind of getting into is, is, what, is what they do today, which is you implement the cryptographic uh, algorithm in hardware instead, which makes it much more difficult to attack. But if you're more interested in this, this uh, there's a nice book on this topic. So people who I talk to call it the book because uh, it's pretty accurate and it has all the people who you need to know. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's some, you know, it, it also covers the, the story of Tron, which CCC people will, will uh, surely know. But it's basically how, how uh, chips actually get hacked, because a lot of times when you look at uh, academic publications, they talk about side channels and how it takes millions of traces and hours of integration, et cetera. And in the real world, you know, it's, Everyone wants to have success off the first time, and they don't want to tinker with this, so they, you know, they get out the bazooka and do what is surely going to work. So, and yeah, so l let's get into that. So, what you you kind of have this? You have to think of uh, classes of attacks when you talk about uh, hardware security. And so, on the left, you have the the least expensive, the most simple attacks are non-invasive attacks. That's where you don't open up the device at all. So, you you connect to it externally. You watch the power consumption. You do something along those lines. And semi-invasive analysis. Now, you're opening up the package, and now maybe you're trying to hit it with uh, with a laser, for example. So, using uh, using a, a laser to induce a fault, flip bits, et cetera. And fully invasive is what I explained before, which is the stuff that I always wanted to do is, you know, there's a circuit manufactured on this chip. I'm going to go in and change the circuit so that I can get at the data. So non-invasive uh, techniques are, are stuff like side channel analysis and, and different types of glitching. And, and fuzzing, et cetera. And so this is actually a project I did together with Torsten, who's up here in the front row, the Datenkrake, which is a nice little uh, FPGA board to play around with. And we'll also, I'll mention how, how you can come and talk to us about that at the end of the talk. But so here you, you, you can really do this low cost. So you can do things like there will be protocol errors. So now if you can talk to the device, you might be able to induce uh, some, some errors and dump a couple of bytes that way. Or you can play around with the clock or the voltage, et cetera. But so why is this not applicable? I kind of touched on this already. So I mean, on the one hand, I mean, this is kind of to compare and contrast. So on the one hand, you have limited resources versus 
organizations that are very well equipped. And we kind of saw in the, in the video, right, this was a professional lab from one of the competitors that hacked this chip. So, so in, in the real world, it's not always, you know, somebody in their garage, although there's also Chris Tarnowski who does all this stuff in his garage too. But I mean, the point is, is that in general, you, you don't have the case where you have limited resources, you have substantial resources. That's kind of a, a, a n n misrepresented uh, in academia. And so the, the thing, like I said before, you want to have it a foolproof attack, something you can do with a single trace. So you don't have to, so like for side channel analysis, uh, a lot of times you'll, you'll talk about millions of traces. So what do people do to prevent side channel analysis? They have a counter, and the counter usually counts to 2 to the 16 minus 1. So it counts to 65,000, and then after that, the card erases itself, and you're done. You can't do anything on this card. So you can't talk about doing a, a million repetitions to, to extract some sort of key. So the, the, again, high security attacks, you always assume that you have a, kind of a black box, but it doesn't stay a black box to you. You, you actually reverse engineer it and you, you, uh, you figure out how the crypto system works, which, which is also kind of, uh, I, I found it interesting today when I saw David's talk, he kind of touched on that as well, is that for, even for their side channel stuff, uh, for, for certain uh, applications, they really have to understand how the crypto system works as well. So anyway, but the main thing is, you know, there, there are countermeasures and and weird stuff that people do on chips nowadays, and you have that on the, uh, you have that in every, you know, chip that you buy nowadays that's relatively secure, and this is enough to, to stop non-invasive techniques, but high uh, security kinds of analysis will always be able to circumvent any techniques implemented on the device, because we can actually change the circuit. So what's, I see reverse engineering, so here we can kind of kind of look at it, so, uh, you know, transistors are created at the surface uh, of the silicon wafer, and now on top of that, we, we have interconnects uh, going around, connecting the different uh, circuit nodes, and uh, basically you have passivation uh, around it. So if you look on this picture, you actually, the MOSFET is actually, you know, here in the, in the middle, and uh, around it, you have passivation. So there's, uh, so, uh, sorry, on top of it, uh, you have these, this metallization. So like I talked about, these are the metal interconnects. And around it, you also have this isolation, which kind of uh, provides the chip structure, and it allows you to deposit layers on top of it, et cetera. And, and so this is also something which uh, a lot of people think, you know, that they look through a microscope, and you can see the tracks running all across the chip. But in reality, you know, there's layers and layers of, of, of this. It's literally glass that you have to remove first before you can access the, the chip. So it's not visible to the eye, but it's there. And so, uh, yeah, but uh, so just continuing. So the, the thing is, you now have a, so uh, let me zoom out, uh, or no, sorry, uh, next slide. So the, the thing that you actually end up doing when you're looking at a device is you begin to, you want to reconstruct the logical function that's actually implemented in the hardware. And to do that is you do what I have here, you image the chip. And so you don't have one layer, you have multiple layers. So usually you have, uh, like on a modern smart card, you might have five seven, to seven or eight metal layers, if you have something like uh, as complex as a Intel CPU, you have something like 15 layers, etc. And so you even see that the complexity going up gets very complicated just because of all the routing you have to do. So, but the process is always the same. So you image the device, you begin to identify the gates, and you begin to reconstruct the netlist. So the netlist is kind of the logical function that the circuit represents. So that's where you see like AND, and the AND gate kind of like as a function. And there, if you sit there with a pen and paper, you can say, OK, what if I have a 1 here and a 0 here? Do, what do I get at the output, et cetera, uh, of, of a very complex multi-stage circuit. So anyway, but the thing we want to do is now that we have the netlist, we can see where's the data decrypted. And now we can isolate that logic, and we can uh, basically extract the secret data there. Because now the chip decrypted the data for us, and so now we can pinpoint that area where it's decrypted and get the data out from there. So just to give you an idea, here's just an example. So this is just a simple, uh, should be a, a, a NAND gate, one of the classics. And uh, so you just have the, the A and B and the output. And in this case, the output's not connected to anything uh, because this was a weird type of gate, but I'm not going to get into that. 
But uh, the, the thing is, like, another thing uh, which people underestimate when they think, you know, you do IC stuff and how do you look at chips and that's unbelievable, you know, how, how, you know, how much experience is behind it. And the reality is what a lot of people, people just haven't seen these kinds of images. So what you do, and the human eye is very good for this, is you look at a chip and all of a sudden you see, hey, those look alike. And over here, those look alike uh, on the sides. So, so what, what this is, is in the middle you had inverters, and on the right and left you have uh, flip-flops. So you don't sit there figuring out, you know, what the logical function is. You, one time with your eye, you recognize that this is a flip-flop, and so you kind of scroll through the device uh, identifying, oh, that, that's a flip-flop, so let me maybe write that down if I'm, if I'm doing this on paper, uh, et cetera. And so the only thing that's missing is this is just the gates, so, but they're somehow logically connected. So let's take a look at that. And so here's an example. Uh, this was some device, and we'll get into what we actually see here. Uh, so we have, a, we have something that starts down here, uh, and, and then it goes up here, and it ends. But it doesn't actually end, it goes down. So now it goes down onto this layer, and so now it goes to the left. And now it goes down one more time. And now, boom, we're in that gate. So this is the input to that inverter. And so now we have the, we have the, the gate. And now we look at the output, because there's only one output. And you can actually see the, the, uh, the contact. You can actually see what's going up. It's the dot. Uh, so that's either the inputs or the outputs. That's the actual connection to the, different, to the other uh, metal layers. So now it, it's going up, obviously, because it can't go down anymore. This is the bottom metal layer. So now it goes up over here. And so now we know, we can see it goes over to the left and up, and boom, we hit the flip-flop. So that was the image we had before. So if you actually reconstructed this, we have some non-volatile memory, because that's where we started off. We know that the chip has its program stored in non-volatile memory, and now we start going from there, and then we have an XOR, and then for whatever reason, we have an inverter, because you can just have inverters sometimes, and it doesn't really affect anything. It just flips a bit, right? So, and then we have our flip-flop, and then all of a sudden, and I didn't show it here, you'll realize that after that, you have the ALU and all these parts, which are actually parts of the core. So, but just keep that in mind. So now, just to, just to give you a better idea of, of what it is, so you, another thing that you do, you don't just start making these images. The first thing you do is you make like an overview of the chip. So here you can already see and get a lot of information about the device. So you can see that you have flash up there because it's a big non-volatile memory. You can see that you have SRAM and EEPROM at the bottom. And then here you have your actual core. And how do I know that that's the core? Well, it's just like when you uh, write, you know, write, so compile something with GCC. So if you were to write assembler by hand, you would get something which is much more humanly readable than uh, something that GCC uh, potentially spits out at you, because it will do tons of optimizations that you've never heard of, et cetera. And the same thing's the case here. So you have this gray area which doesn't have any, any structure to it. And the reason for that is it went through uh, synthesis. It went through something which spit out the most optimized uh, uh, code, uh, H, well, I mean, layout netlist that it could. And that's what gets placed there. And so in the middle, in the core, you see completely irregular structures. So it's almost, depending on the device, it'll look very gray or something between you know, black and, and, uh, and copper or whatever. So, Anyway, but the, the thing to remember is that, so we have the flash, and this data goes into the core. So somewhere between the flash and the core, we can find these wires, which I sh had on the previous slide. So this is uh, the case if you're extracting data from a device which doesn't have encryption. So what, is it, what if it has encryption? Well, we've kind of discussed this already, that a CPU, it can't process encrypted data. So the NVM is encrypted, and now this data comes out of the non-volatile memory, and it goes into the core. But before it gets to the core, it has to be decrypted. So now we know that we have a decryption function here somewhere. So now let's go back to this. So in the case where we don't have any encryption function, we would have just non-volatile memory shooting straight through into our, our registers. But now we have an XOR, hint, hint, which we don't even know what the other input is. And the other input is some sort of encryption function which we don't even care about because the data we know for a fact will be decrypted on the right side. 
So that's just to give you an idea of the, of the kind of general workflow. Uh, so you can also automate this process. So this is like DGate for professionals. So this is uh, uh, Olivier Thomas's uh, talk from Recon. And so what he actually did was he did something much more advanced than DGate. And this is literally a chip where it's stitching the images in real time. And he can just scroll around the chip and, and see all the connections and extract uh, partial or full netlists, et cetera. And so this is kind of like, uh, I mean, there's, you should, you should, I don't want to take anything away from him because he, he did a really good talk and he explained a lot of the engineering decisions because he also started with something like DGate and why he ended up doing things like this and why this works much better. And it's kind of interesting for even from an IC engineering point of view to listen to this. But this is, uh, this is kind of the direction that if you, when people ask me, you know, where do you, what do you think uh, attacks are going to be in the future? So now, if everyone is uh, making their own you know, custom uh, hardware, uh, then you have uh, software like this to deobfuscate it for you. Because the obfuscation that you did is you converted your algorithm from software to hardware, put it on the device, and you assume that no one will ever be able to extract this. And uh, another thing which I already had a discussion in, in kind of the speaker room that, that I expect is with software like this, you can also reconstruct the masks. So now you can go ahead and, and produce your own uh, copy of this chip if you wanted to. And so the interesting thing is, uh, let's say you have something like, let's say somebody in the world was, was smart enough to build a Bitcoin ASIC, which was substantially better than all the other Bitcoin ASICs. So now somebody in a country which uh, doesn't respect you know, patent and IP law as much as you do maybe in Germany, uh, goes ahead and constructs their own mask set and sends it off to somewhere. And now they get the best, effectively, the best Bitcoin ASIC without spending uh, a year of development of this thing. And now they can produce it for, and save money over going to the, to the manufacturer and, and having them produce the ASICs for them. So, I mean, the fact that you can deobfuscate hardware and automate this, it makes, it, it opens up a lot of areas, uh, new areas of research that people haven't really thought about. I mean, the other obvious cases, so let's say you have pay TV again, so now you have a, a smart card, which basically does some sort of encryption on it. And so now you go, you deobfuscate this, you extract the cryptographic, you know, the hardware uh, crypto that's implemented on the device, and now you design the, the pirate card, except now instead of it having a microcontroller, it has an FPGA, because on the FPGA, you can now synthesize whatever the hardware function did. And now, again, you have uh, piracy everywhere. OK, but this is all kind of a background to, to IC security in general. So let's get into what, what we actually did. And so we did stuff with the IC backside. So this is, these are things that, so these are attacks that go all the way through the silicon substrate. And actually, uh, I don't have it uh, on me. I think it's in my bag. But I, I also have uh, the chips that we opened up. So if you come and see me, I, I can let you look at what they look like. Uh, so uh, yeah, so to understand the back side, let's talk about the front side first, because the front side is what was done up until today. And so now, you, you, you kind of front side attacks are becoming unattractive, which is why we were motivated to look at the back side. And the reason for that is you have lots and lots of interconnect layers, like I described before. Like on an Intel chip, you would have no way to do anything to the chip from the front side. There's just too many metal layers. You would spend too much time moving signals out of the way just to interface to the, to the very uh, you know, transistor level or to the very low level of the device. Um, and the other thing is you have countermeasures like active shields and meshes. So what manufacturers do now is you, so let's say you buy a, a SIM card. So if you buy a SIM card, uh, you'll probably have a not very secure device because everyone wants their SIM card for free. So no one's willing to pay a lot of uh, money for it. But if you go to uh, a big, uh, you know, smart card vendor and say, I want the most secure card you have, what they'll do is they'll take the SIM card and they'll put another three layers of metal on it and they'll say, you know, now we implemented these crazy protection uh, schemes, these crazy signals that go all the way around and just imagine you come down with your needle and you'll end up shorting them and if you try to open them up using a fib, you'll short them as well and we can detect this. And so, I mean, technically there are still ways around it, which Chris demonstrated uh, at Black Hat in 2010 uh, when he kind of 
kind of showed this on an Infineon chip, which had a lot of the countermeasures. But the thing is, it's still a nuisance. So what it looks like, this is kind of the image we had before. But the reality is, you have something like this on a, on a modern smart card. And what's completely irrelevant to the actual circuit underneath is this mesh, so these protective uh, layers on top. So yeah, so that, that's why we want to flip the chip over and go in through the other side. So we'll get into that in a bit. And you can do other stuff as well. So you can actually do sensors. So what you can do is, assuming that the density of, of what you have on top of the chip is so high, you can assume that no light will ever get through. So if you ever see light underneath this mesh, then you know that somebody opened up the chip. So stuff like that. And this is really stuff that is implemented on lots and lots of devices. And interestingly enough, the smart card industry remains the industry which has the most you know, secure devices. I mean, I was talking to uh, some, some, some of our colleagues and friends, and they say, you know, this is just obscene how paranoid the smart card industry is. Because you would think that the value of data stored on something like on some larger devices, say on a smartphone processor, is much more interesting. Anyway, long story short, uh, it actually gets easier too, which is also something people don't want to believe. So there's actually a machine to do backside polishing. So this is a electric, so it's, it's, a, it's called a, a CMP a chemical mechanical polisher. And the thing is, it doesn't have chemicals or electronics. So to me, it's completely mechanical. But uh, it basically, what it does is it does this. So this is some 74 series logic we threw on there. Uh, just some chip for those who don't know who 74 series logic is. And so what's happening is this machine, you kind of limit the motion that it has in the x and the y axis, and it kind of like spins around and it hits the one limiter and then it wobbles around to the other side and up and down. And so you let this run for a couple of hours with, uh, as Bunny accurately said, with some kind of slurry. So you can use like diamond based slurry and stuff like this. And uh, basically, I mean, d depending on, on what you want to do, a lot of times it's enough to actually just get a bit which is which is uh, uh, manufactured for for the for the uh, packaging that you're going through but in any case so you you kind of c come in and you open up the chip from the back and that's it now you you haven't used any of the fuming nitric acid that David showed and you don't have any of this mess and you don't need a chemical hood and and all this so very very nice this backside stuff so but so the thing to remember, though, is that so the devices, the actual transistors, we can see they're at the bottom. So we can actually access them directly, uh, potentially. I mean, depending on the size, this gets a little bit more hairy if you're doing like 45 nanometers. But if you're doing something like a smart card, like 90 man nanometers, this shouldn't be a problem. And 180 nanometers is, gets even easier. And stuff like older smart cards, let's say 240 nanometers, this shouldn't be a problem at all. And so anyway, but, but the, the countermeasures, they, they're not there. There's no countermeasures to protect against backside attacks. So, uh, so and the other funny thing is, is that uh, if you look at a modern SOC, so like something that's in your smartphone, it'll be this gigantic BGA package. So how do they do these BGA packages? They actually, what they do is they, they have all the metallization on the top, and they flip the chip over onto kind of this carrier, and then they have the, the BGA balls like directly underneath. But so now your backside's actually facing up, so it's even easier. You're, you just take your, you know, you could even take, depending on how you do the polishing, you could even take the whole PCB and just polish down the chip, just the one that you need, and now you would gain access to it. But the thing, the thing that which Kind of, which to me uh, says or explains why why people never looked into this is this, which is uh, uh, to scale image of of what you actually have. So the thickness of the substrate is actually several times the thickness of all of the active devices and the wiring, etc. And so you know, people would say, "You're telling me I have to remove," you know. I have to remove, instead of removing 10 micrometers of this chip, I have to remove 300. You know, how, is that, how does that make it any easier? But the reality is you don't risk damaging anything if you go through the other side. You can safely thin uh, most chips to something like 10, uh, so 10 micrometers or even less without affecting anything on the chip, other than it'll lose some, it'll get a little bit more warm potentially, because the substrate's actually really useful for transporting heat away. So 
what, what this all looks like is this, and I remembered, because Colin always tells me I should include these images, I remember to include them this time. So what it looks like is, is something like this. So what, it, what we did here is, so this is the chip, which was uh, polished. This is actually the backside. So the label, the text on the chip is on the other side. So the chip's actually mounted upside down in this custom PCB, which we made with our wonderful LPKF uh, uh, Protomont milling machine. They should send us more parts for free. And uh, because it, we go through a lot, that machine's actually pretty expensive to run. I mean, they, they know where the money is. It's like the Gillette model on steroids. So, so uh, anyway, but, but this is a, it's a so, so th that's what it is. So it's a custom board and the chip's mounted upside down. So you can kind of see it from this angle even better. So you can see that you can actually see the silicon in there. I was thinking about holding like uh, s some drawing on the other side because you can, you can see the reflection, right? So I could have like a face or something, but I didn't have to do it. But anyway, but so that's, that's what you need to know. So now we take the chip, we polish the backside, and now we're at 30 micrometers of thickness. And now the fun ensues. So the first thing that we did a couple of years ago was this. So a lot of people uh, have never heard of this, so people who've seen my talk uh, obviously know about this, but what this actually is, is you take an infrared camera and you let it watch your chip as it executes data, and you get something like this. You can actually see the photons that tr transistors emit, because with a certain very low probability, a transistor that switches emit photons. But now if you sit there with your camera and you repeat this operation many times, then you can actually get an image like this. And so what this is, is in the middle, you can see uh, where uh, memory access is happening in SRAM. And up top is the, is the actual address. So now I'm going to let this run. So now you can see the layout of different addresses on the, on the device. And not only that, but you can find uh, data-dependent parts of the circuit, too. And how to, I'll let you figure out how we know this is data-dependent. <laughs> so I was, at the beginning when we were starting to do this research, this is what I expected to happen, you know, like from the very beginning. And then it took us like a year to find an area of the chip where you could actually see the, the data bus like this. And that's what it is. So this is actually a, a, a region of the chip where the data bus comes in and it's addressing the SRAM. So what you see is on the bottom right, you see the lower address bits, et cetera. Or sorry, this is the, the, the data bus, but it's kind of shared. So depending on, on kind of how, many, how much logic it has to go through, uh, depending on how many stages, because of how, how it's structured. I mean, so people who write HDL will understand where I'm coming from. You need bigger transistors because it goes through more logic, et cetera. And so that kind of explains what, what you see there. And so, uh, yeah, but the, the, and the, the thing is, the, so you, ha you still have the limitations that you have with a lot of these non-invasive techniques. So you need millions and millions and millions of integrations. So to get a good image, you need something like, you need the loop to execute. So you need the transistor. So the, the fact that you see a transistor approximately once every 10,000 times the transistor switches means that you need millions of switches before you can see uh, something as nice as this. But you can also apply it to, to other stuff as well. So here's a chip that had a AS on it. And so I couldn't find the, the other uh, image when I was clicking my, my slides together. But so actually, when you look at this very corner, you, this region, everything within that box would completely disappear if the AAS wasn't running. And now if the hardware AAS was running, you would see this blob in the corner. And this is very nice. So I, I, we never kind of verified this, but I'm sure this is the AAS because uh, you could see that with other peripherals as well. But so now the thing that, uh, that you have to think about is if light can uh, get out through the silicon substrate because it's transparent to infrared light, then that means infrared light can also get in, which is where we get this. So <laughs> what you can do is actually use uh, lasers as well. So uh, what this actually is, is uh, it's, uh, instead of taking the image from, from the front of the chip, what, we, what you do is you open it up, and you don't even have to thin it afterwards. You just have to remove the package. And so you take a laser scanning uh, microscope. So in our case, we have one of the industry standards, uh, Hamamatsu uh, Famos. But this is actually, I mean, for I know that, so th the research that I've been presenting up until now was done with our optical technologies research group. And 
those guys, like for them to build one of these, it's like a, a month's work. So anybody, any university group that builds optic stuff, like when, when they figure out that this is interesting to people doing security, they're shocked because this is so, su such an easy task for them. But basically you get a very good resolution because you're actually scanning the laser. So you get, even though you don't have uh, the resolution that you know, so even though you're using something like a one micrometer laser, you get a very nice, you get a, a, a better resolution than you would expect because you're actually scanning the laser and the overlap, you can kind of compute it out, et cetera. But so you can get nice images like this of the chip and you can kind of already see what's on it without you spit. So this is on a, on a something like a, a SIM card or, or a smart card package. This is literally taking a scalpel and just removing the ground plane, which is, which is the middle contact. So you open that up, you have your backside exposed, you put it under the FAMOS and you can already see what kind of chip it is. You can even read if you, I don't have it in this image or actually Actually, yeah, I do. I think in one of the corners in the bottom right one or in the bottom left one, you actually see Atmel and what revision this is, et cetera. So this is also very nice. But the coolest thing that we did uh, using, using this is uh, thermal stimulation. So what we actually did for this attack was uh, we basically uh, dropped, so what we did was we browned out the device. So we supplied, I believe the supply voltage, we took it down from like, uh, 1.8 on, on, uh, on the Infineon chip, which I'll show in a second, and we dropped it to 0.6, which is enough where the data remains in the memory because it's not enough to lose the data, but it's not enough to execute anything either. And so now the chip is stuck in this zombie state, and if you look very closely, so what we can do now is we can scan with a laser. And so now the chip's not executing, there's no switching, and we can measure the current with a very precise current amplifier. And so what we can get, using that technique is an image like this. If you look very closely into the image, you can see what the data is within the SRAM. So now what you're doing is you're browning out the device. The device is basically stuck in a zombie state, like I said, and now you're scanning across the device. And based on the laser coming in, you're affecting kind of the leakage currents that are remnant on the device. And depending on whether there's a one or a zero there, you'll get a different kind of uh, response in your image. And that's what you can see there. So the nice thing was uh, people always say, you know, that's great, but you know, S, who cares about this because uh, you know on a, on a real smart card the memory will be encrypted but so on uh, the MED which Karsten did quite a bit of research on uh, and, and presented in Black Hat, et cetera, you actually have SRAM to store the keys that encrypt the SRAM. So that's not a good solution. So you can kind of see uh, that you can begin to read them out there, although we didn't really take this to the to the uh, final kind of stages. But the other thing is there's, there's uh, other things being proposed as well. So big, like if you get into hardware research and, and academia, one of the big things now is puffs. And the most popular kind of puff, so puff is a physically unclonable function, and that means that you figure out some way to have your device generate you a unique response. So the easiest way to do this is you take an SRAM, and each SRAM will have a different response. So you just read, you give it, you power it up, and it won't just give you back one, either one or either zero. It'll give you back some random, you know, data that will be. It won't be random. It'll be. Uh, it'll have data which differs from every other chip, but it'll be the same every time you power down this device and power it back up. So it'll, it's like a unique fingerprint. And so now you can see that you, this is really stupid to use SRAM as well because this is a really effective technique for, for reading it out. But anyway, but then we got into kind of fully invasive stuff, uh, stuff that, that we did. And so now we want to actually go through uh, and actually touch, you know, modify the circuitry. So we kind of uh, just, the first thing that we did was we, we continued with this topic of puffs. And so now we said we wanted to clone a physically unclonable function. So we read it, we could read it out and we knew what the data was that was stored in it. And so now we wanted to take a second instance of the device and basically uh, turn it from this uh, to to the next one, and I actually see I kind of screwed up these slides, but I'll get I'll get into that in a in a second. I have the wrong, but actually, well, let, let me just comment on that since that's the next slide. So actually, in this in this uh, one of our attacks in this year's or the first issue of CT for 2014, it mentions us, which is this is ironically exactly what uh, claimants and I wear in the when we're working on the fib. So. 
uh, it actually describes a, a lot of the things that I'll be talking about. So if you're, if you're curious, definitely take a look at that. But so again, getting back to the SRAM, we knew what the SRAM was. So we could, uh, we could do a couple of things there. So what we would do is we would uh, take a second SRAM array and we would prevent it from ever storing the value that we didn't want it to store. So we would program it to only be able to store a zero or only be able to store a one. And so that's the top image. So you can actually see the holes are actually going down to, to the actual contact. And so the, the transistor is completely gone there, or at least the, the gate. The gate's no longer contacted, even if some of the gate is, is uh, left. And so the, but it turned out, you know, since we work with, so the, all of this work was done in collaboration with our semiconductor devices guys, they said, you know, this is way too simple. We can do it even better because we had a bunch of research previously on trimming transistors. So now the bottom image, what we did was you thin the transistor and it turns out that if you thin a transistor, it becomes faster. So now you can set the value that you want to be at startup. And so now as opposed to the first image where it basically became a ROM, the second image, it still behaves like an SRAM, but we can basically program its, its startup behavior. So that was, that was really nice. And these are actual images from our focused ion beam workstation, which I should actually also mention what this is. So I think a lot of people are familiar with, uh, with uh, what a SEM is, so a scanning electron microscope. This is like a SEM, except with ions. So no, OK. But so what it actually means is that uh, if you have uh, ions, you have a, a lot more mass. And what, what you can do is you can put chemicals into, into the vacuum chamber where you actually have your device. And so now you can basically stimulate a reaction to happen with nanometer precision. So now you deposit a gas that etches away the silicon substrate, for example. And so now you go over it with your ion beam and you say only, please, only this you know, two by two, uh, or let's say something more realistic, let's say only this 10 by 10 you know, nanometer square, o please only react here. And then this is what a fib lets you do. So this is what, how you manipulate uh, devices. I mean, this is how the most advanced attacks work. And the thing that I should also uh, mention here is, again, this is something which is done when chips are produced. So when they do an initial generation of, of some chips, uh, they'll run into tons and tons of issues. So they'll have stuff that doesn't work. And instead of creating a completely new design and a completely new chip, they have different ways and they've developed different ways over the years to, to basically do like a hot fix. So do like a fix to see if it fixes all the other issues or without, you know, maybe they can kill two birds with one stone before they have to produce a new chip, et cetera. Anyway. But so this is kind of uh, this was kind of the simple case, right? We're just going, you know, shooting. We're thinning the chip. We're just completely removing the transistors that we don't want because we know what an SRAM is. SRAMs always have almost identical layouts, independent of which device you use, etc. And so now, uh, now, we, but what we actually want to do is we want to probe it and we want to extract some some data, and we want to do some other stuff too. So. This is what we did kind of here. And again, so we thinned it to 25 micrometers. And then what we do is, so let's say we want to attack uh, some signal, which is, let's say, over here. So what this looks like is we thin it. And this is all approximately to scale. So after we thin it, we might leave you know, 25, 50 micrometers, something like that. And so now, after that, we take the fib. And now we make a, what's called a fib trench. And so now we make a trench approximately like so. And so now we have a, a hole basically going up to where our transistors are. And now, uh, we again, we wanted to target the wire in the middle. So now we have to remove just in that area. We have to just remove uh, stuff there. And so we do that. And then we deposit some, some metal. So now uh, you see that it's kind of exposed, that signal is exposed to the outside world. And now we can come in to, with a probing needle. And this is a, also approximately to scale. This is a one micrometer probing needle that you can't see with your eye, but you can, uh, it's still, you know, orders of magnitude bigger than the actual transistors there. And so the kind of the, the, the steps that we went through was we had to figure out a way to, to navigate through the chip. So on the left is an is a optical image of the device that we, the, I mean, these are actually images that, that Chris did. Uh, and this is actually, so I'll use this opportunity to mention if anyone's ever at TorCon, this is a training that you should all go and, and check out. It's, I know Karsten did it uh, when Chris couldn't do it, and Bunny uh, did it with, with Karsten as well. So it's an awesome training where you actually get to put some 
probes down on a device, et cetera, and you get, a, get your hands dirty and, and you get an idea of how all this stuff works. But so now we, we don't have an image like this and we can't just look through a microscope and see what's going on. But what we can do in our fib uh, is the substrate's thinned, so now we can use an infrared camera, which you can get for the fib, to approximately orient ourselves. So this is, uh, this is actually, so these are identical regions. So something over there, which looks like that in an optical image, you know, perfectly crisp, looks completely blurred over here, but just based on the spacing, you can still figure out where it is. And this was just a, a second example. So now we find where we want to go, and we start making the, the trenches, which is exactly what we have here. And so the, the the wire that we're actually targeting is, is uh, this was, as far as I remember, this, I think this was metal three. So this was not, so this is, you know, the transistors, the transistors go up to metal one, then there's metal two, and metal three, there was something connecting between two gates, and this is where we're targeting them. So we're going all the way from, you know, basically effectively going through three layers of the device to, to, to probe it. And so now we actually deposit some metal, which is, uh, which is, you can see the conductor, that's the kind of blob on the, or it's the bar coming out. And the interesting thing is, you know, when I showed this to Chris, he said that's the dirtiest fib out of it I've ever seen in my life. And he's, uh, he's, he's, he's right, but the thing was, uh, we screwed up. So the first time we shorted out two of the wires when we were doing this in the fib. But the nice thing about the fib is, if you screw up and you short two wires, you can disconnect them with a different gas and then connect the wires using a different gas where you're depositing metal. And so now we fix the chip and now we can, uh, we can come down and probe the chip as we wanted to before, which looks like so approximately. Uh, so there, I mean, Clayman's also built a, a probing amplifier, which, which uh, did its job. I mean, he even used some spice simulations to, to see how well it'll, it'll behave. But it, I mean, in reality, you could do this a lot more quick and dirty. So anyway, but the, the uh, getting back just kind of a, as a summary, so the CPU can uh, work on the encrypted data. So now we isolate a, a signal where the data has been decrypted for us. And that's where we put our needles down and extract the encrypted data. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's pr pretty much all that needs to be said. So the, the uh, kind of a, an interesting thing that, that we thought of next was uh, something which was covered pretty well in the, in the console hacking talk yesterday, which was how do you do uh, in like modern days, how do you do uh, crypto? So a lot of times what they do is they have fuses, which they do to program, uh, I mean, they, they use one-time programmable fuses to program a key into the SOC. And so what we see here is an area on an 80 mega microcontroller, because then we could easily play around with the fuses and set them and clear them, et cetera. And so now this is an area where we have the fuses. And you can actually see if the fuse is set or not, because those, those dots in, the, in, in both rows, so here you have eight fuses. And so now you can see if the fuse is set or not. And the reason for that is how the image that you get on the FIB, these are actually secondary electrons. So these are electrons that get uh, reflected off the device and come back and basically into your imaging uh, system. And so here, because of the fact that you have a fuse and you have a floating gate, the electrical field, et cetera, is, is different and there's some sort of charge there. And so now you get a different contrast. So you get a different amount of electrons coming back at you and you can see this. And so I remember when we were sitting there, you know, so now we can set and clear the fuse the brute force way, which is either connected with wire or, or disconnected by disconnecting the wire. And I remember when we were sitting there with, you know, Starbuck and Claimants, and as soon as, uh, as soon as AVR, we were, somebody, I think Starbuck was sitting there just testing AVR dude, and as soon as, uh, as soon as we, you know, set it, you know, check AVR dude, what are the fuses set to? And then, you know, it's like, instead of it being uh, FF, it's all of a sudden it's, you know, 7F or whatever. And then uh, I just remember, you know, we're jumping up and down and high-fiving, you know, we we're so happy. But uh, the nice thing is with these uh, contrast images, you, you can actually also see, uh, you can actually also see how you're removing uh, the gate, which is what you see here. So you can see that, uh, you can see in the, the contrast is also representative of the voltage that you have where you're looking at it. So if you see on the left and the right, the dots are actually the contacts going up until, up, up to the metal layers of the floating gate. So as we remove the floating gate, you'll see that the voltage changes. So we've actually changed the value stored in the fuse because all of a sudden, the right side isn't the same voltage level as the left side. It changes in, in its color. So that was kind of nice to see too. But anyway, but so kind of the summary is, uh, 
you know, advanced, uh, a lot of, these are kind of claims that, that we hear a lot of times and, and a lot of claims that you hear uh, from, uh, from, especially if you send in academic papers that reviewers send back to you. So like, you know, we have advanced packaging, you know, invasive analysis, you know, this is all never gonna happen. And the truth is, like I showed you, we don't even need chemicals anymore to open up these chips. So now you have a backside polishing machine and you put your chip in there and you let it polish away and you get a very nice result. And all, after that, you only need a fib. You don't need all of these disgusting chemicals that nowadays at universities who don't wanna get sued by you know, health insurance companies are very hard to get to. So anyway, but then uh, the, the other claim is, you know, Attackers must first reverse engineer a device to attack it, and so this is only this is not you know applicable to the real world because who's going to reverse engineer uh, a device? And and although that may be true, that most of the cases and almost all the cases, the attacker is not going to reverse engineer the full integrated circuit. He's gonna he doesn't even have to reverse engineer that much. I showed you what the what the process is of finding the areas where the decryption is. It's not it's not even reverse engineering, it's just following the lines. Uh, anyway, and so uh, the reverse engineering modern ICs is impossible. They're way too complex. And in reality you saw that you know, the gates, they appear again and again. So like a, a cell library on a chip nowadays, it might have something like 60 or 70 different types of gates. So fine, you spend two weeks studying all the gates, and now you have all the gates on that device. You know all of them. So now you can say XOR, inverter, uh, flip-flop, you know, this type of flip-flop, that type of flip-flop, et cetera. You, you just know them, and you can literally recognize them with your eye when you're sitting in front of the, the, uh, basically the images. So yeah, the other thing is, you know, data in NVM is encrypted, so who cares? And we saw, you know, if it's encrypted, it has to get decrypted for the chip to be able to do anything sensible with it. And the last one, which was my personal favorite, is devices will stop working if you do any kind of backside attacks on them. And the truth is, I can say with 100% of certainty, we've removed 99% of the device and it still works fine without, you know, literally 99% of the thickness of the backside we've removed and the device still works. So that's not uh, true at all. So just a couple of acknowledgements, uh, you know, Chris, uh, Olivier, Starbuck, who, was, uh, who, was, who really got me motivated. Uh, so Starbuck back in the day, and this kind of gets into, because I'm going to do questions after this. Number one question that I get, when, especially when people come and talk to me like offline, is how do I get into this? And Starbuck said, learn HDL. And he's right. The best way to get into this is learn HDL and try to, try to implement you know, your own soft core processors and start writing this, because you'll get into the mentality mentality that the engineers have that design these ships, and it's not rocket science, it's quantum physics. <laughs> but uh, it's, no, I'm, I'm kidding, of course, because from a logical point of view, it's much, it's much simpler than that even. So yeah, and the other two people I, I'd like to sincerely thank are my colleagues, Clemens, who did all of the kind of invasive uh, crazy stuff, and Alex, who was, basically did his PhD on all the optic stuff that we used for our experiments. So questions, oh, and I should, before, I'll use this as a, I'll usurp this as a small opportunity to say whoever wants to talk to me and see all of the lovely devices that I have with me, or wants to potentially buy this lovely device called the Datenkrake can come and uh, find us in the hack center. So we're kind of in the bottom and to the left in one of the alleys, and uh, you can find us there. You can look, uh, I, I took a picture for the Datenkrake uh, Twitter account if you want to find it there. But I guess I, I don't know how much time I have for questions. Five? Yeah, okay, thank you very much for this interesting talk. So we, we still have a couple of minutes for okay. questions, so if you have a question, just get up and get in front of one of the mics. Uh, do we have a question from the internet? Yeah, um, Forum is asking what the usual amount of destroyed chips is you need to get the information you're looking for, typically. So I mean, that really depends if you're, so the answer is kind of complicated, right? So. In terms of, uh, usually when you're studying, so I, I, can, I can name a number that I know from Chris. So when Chris was attacking the Infineon 66PE, before he had his first success, he destroyed something like 80 chips. 
So he spent 80 times, you know, on the average, you know, four or six hours of work before he succeeded. But this is a really secure device. So if you're attacking something simpler than this, you won't go through as many chips. And the other thing is, once you've done this for, for so let's say, uh, so in general, you'll, you'll see, that, you know, th this chip might not only be used in one device, it might be used in lots of devices. So once you have the layout, once you know what this chip looks like, you don't have to repeat this again. So you have to, I mean, you, you know what the layout is. So at that point, it's one chip, one success. So, but kind of this, this practicing and education stage is, is uh, less trivial. You need, a, you need a understand how the chip works to reverse engineer, et cetera. So the reverse engineering needs a couple of devices. Okay, then mic three, please. This is a really interesting talk, thanks. Um, the Intel RNG um, doping problem yeah. that you may have seen earlier today yeah. Um, do you think that there are any applications to backside scanning to try to detect? So you don't even have to like backside. I mean, anyway. Th so this this was an interesting uh, interesting paper, and a lot of the claims in there are valid. And I would agree with especially everything that they say in terms of you know inducing additional side channel leakage. That I completely agree with. But the thing is, there are ways to detect this. You know, and the the industry has faced this problem too because sometimes you produce a chip, and for whatever reason, the transistor is not working, and it's because you know you have some creep. Of your of whatever uh, dopants you're depositing over into the next well, and so what, what you can do is what's done with ROMs. So you basically use uh, you use other chemicals and you basically dope them again to make them stand out in a in a scanning electron microscope image. But you wouldn't do this through the backside. What you would do is completely delayer the device. We're completely removing all the metal and just be left with your, your basically your wells, and then you would basically color them, you know, stain them so that you can see them in a in a SEM image. This would be this would be one way to verify this. But of course, the claim is true that you know how realistic is it for Intel to do this after they have some production going? You know, can they do this every week? Can they do this every month? Can they do this every time they? They produce something. I would say a company like Intel, yes. But when you get into low-cost smart cards, I would agree that you might have better success in hiding something there. Thank you. OK, then uh, microphone number two, please. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I have actually a detailed question about the SRAM readout with the infrared laser. I was wondering if that actually worked with the standard amplifier that came with the FAMOS, and whether you needed to probe the device for that, or if that worked on the external leads. No, no. So we we were just looking at the supply voltage. So it wasn't using the. It was literally measuring the the current through the supply voltage of the device. Uh, and this was, I mean, this was again working on smart cards and working on microcontrollers. So we even did it on a 130 nanometer uh, uh, MSP430, and this worked great there. And, but the, the other question, I think it works with the FAMOS, multi, uh, um, with the, the FAMOS amplifier, the standard one, but ours was broken, so we used a different one. And so that's actually another thing for people who don't work with failure analysis equipment. It's, uh, it's like a matter of you sitting there and praying that your equipment works on whichever day you want to use it. Because I mean, like for some of the, I'll, I'll, I'll tell this you know, story because people will appreciate it. I just remember when we were doing these Fib edits, we lost the X, and the Y stage, or no, sorry, yeah, it was, yeah, the X and the Y stage on the fib. So afterwards, we were using nanometer screws, so one of us was standing there and actually moving the fib stage across the chip, but the thing is, once you approximately get it, you can still scan with the beam. That, that's not mechanical. You just have to approximately get to that area. But I mean, we would still have crazy stuff, like sit there with a screwdriver, tapping on the relays until they, until they let go so the stage can go a little bit, et cetera, so it's horrible, you know? Anyway, I, I say the, the kind of the people ask us how, how well do these attacks scale, and I say we attacked, we more than successfully attacked 10 year old or 5 year old chips with a 10 year old fib. So now if we got a new fib today, we could attack uh, newer chips as well. But I mean, your question was uh, kind of the laser scanning. But yeah, failure analysis equipment is a nightmare. Okay, then maybe one short question from the internet. Do you have one? Yeah, um, Chico is asking, wouldn't an asynchronous processor design render the analysis a lot more difficult to the point it's practically impossible? So I'm not sure what 
they mean from an asynchronous processor design? I mean, you have a lot of, I, I mean, I, I would say, I, I don't know how that would affect anything. I mean, in terms of obfuscation, yes, but I mean, the, the, the kinds of attacks that we were presenting were understanding what the, the you know, the actual algorithm is, or being able to reproduce the device, produce a clone of it, et cetera. So I, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure. If the person was here, I could ask for Okay, then our time is up. The people at the mics can grab Dimitri after the talk and ask him. So give him a warm round of applause again. Thank you.